Okay, so welcome everyone. Thanks all for being here. And so today, uh, it's our great pleasure to have uh, Michael Dameron from Georgia Tech, who will be telling us about critical first passage percolation in two dimensions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, right, so um, I'll talk about uh, first passage percolation, uh, what's known as the critical case. So this is not normally the case that people uh, study, um, but um, it's pretty interesting and it's related to uh, kind of more to critical percolation than to um, usual, um, usual things in first passage percolation. So um, I'll talk about some new work, which is not, um, not actually uh, posted yet, but um, um, also a bunch of old work. So it'll be a little bit of a review on the topic. And also this is joined with a lot of different people. Um, so um, I'll mention them throughout the talk. <clears throat> okay, so let's, uh, let's start with the usual setup for uh, first passage percolation. We'll look on Z2 here. Normally people uh, study on ZD or other graphs, but we'll restrict to two dimensions. And uh, so here's my picture of two dimensions. Now on every edge here, we're going to put a uh, non-negative weight, TE, and we'll assume that these weights are IID. Although uh, there's a lot of work done on this model with just uh, translation invariant edge weights. Um, you can get a lot of uh, strange behavior. Okay, so that, those are our edge weights. And uh, now if we take any path, can't really draw. So here's a path gamma. There's no restriction on the paths. They can move in any direction. Then we define the passage time of the path gamma just to be the sum of the edge weights. Uh, for the edges in gamma. So that's the amount of time it takes me to uh, traverse the entire path. And then between vertices X and Y, we want to get from X to Y in the minimal possible time. So we define TXY to be the infimum overall gamma going from X to Y of the passage time of gamma. And just for uh, some uh, notation that we'll use uh, quite a bit, we'll write F for the distribution function of, um, of one of the edge weights uh, of T. Okay, so uh, the way we've defined T here has some pretty uh, basic properties. So uh, first it's a pseudometric. Uh, that is, uh, it's clearly symmetric and satisfies the triangle inequality. Uh, the only thing that's in question for, uh, um, for it to be a metric is that, uh, well, some of the edge weights could be zero. So uh, T is a metric, uh, if and only if, so this is almost surely, if and only if uh, there are no zero edge weights. So the probability that T is zero, which is in our notation F zero, if this is zero. Right, if there's zero edge weights and you could have, uh, if you just look at the endpoints of an edge with zero weight, then those have zero distance, but they're, they're different points. Okay, so a lot of people study this uh, model as uh, kind of a random metric space. You want to understand what are, the, um, what are the geometry of random balls in this metric, what are the asymptotics of balls and, um, and this distance function. <coughs> so, um, we will mostly consider a case where there are a lot of zero edge weights. So uh, it turns out to be a transition in the behavior of the model, depending on the probability that, there's an, uh, that there are zeros. That's what I'll describe now. There's uh, something like a phase transition in F0. So to describe this, I'll look at the, uh, the passage time or the distance between zero and uh, the boundary of a box of size n. So in, in the talk, my notation bn will be uh, the box minus n n squared. And I'll look at the passage time from zero to the boundary. So that is, I take, um, I look at all possible paths from zero to the boundary and take their passage time and look at the infima. Okay, so um, how does this uh, variable behave? If I look at this passage time, 
Well, uh, there are two uh, possible cases. So uh, first, if F0 is less than a half, so one half is the uh, critical value for Bernoulli percolation on uh, two dimensions. Uh, that's exactly where uh, if you're below a half, then you have no infinite components of zeros. If you're above a half, then you have an infinite component of zeros. So in this phase, uh, we have no infinite component of zeros and uh, this passage time grows linearly. So uh, it's asymptotic to some constant times n, uh, almost surely, uh, meaning that if I divide by n, then, um, then I get an almost sure limit, which is a constant. You can read this, uh, uh, what the constant is off of the shape theorem. Uh, I guess this c is positive here. Okay, uh, that's kind of the normal case that people, uh, people usually study that's associated to uh, you know, KPZ and random matrices and whatever else. Uh, the other phase is where um, F0 is bigger than a half. So there I have an infinite cluster of zeros. So clearly if I want to get from zero to the boundary box size M, if this cluster intersects uh, the box, then I just need to travel to the cluster. And then because all of the edge weights are zero there, I can travel throughout it in zero time. So, uh, so because of that, uh, this passage time, the sequence of passage times is bounded almost sure. And in this, uh, this phase, people uh, have studied this also, but this is more related to uh, the chemical distance and supercritical percolation. Because once you get into the infinite cluster, you just take the best path in the infinite cluster. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about the, uh, I guess what we would call the critical case. That's where F0 is equal to a half. So, uh, you can hear Alexa in the background. Um, F0 is a half, this is the critical case. Okay, in this case, um, First question we want to uh, understand is how, how does this sequence grow? C0 boundary BN, what is the growth rate? So um, this question is, is uh, more difficult than in the other cases. Um, <clears throat> and um, the answer will really depend on the distribution. So I'll give you uh, some history here. So uh, the first result that I mentioned was by Keston in the 80s. So this results actually for general dimensions. Uh, so if you're in dimension bigger than uh, two, then the critical value is gonna change. Uh, it'll be PC for bond percolation there. There's no exact formula, but um, you know, as D increases, it, it goes to zero. But anyway, you have to, you have to change um, changes value of F zero. Uh, so here, um, the result is that uh, the passage time divided by N converge to zero almost surely. So the, I don't think this result was explicitly was proved, but um, the result I'm referring to is that the time constant is zero uh, when, uh, when F zero equals BC. And from that, you can get this result. So this says that the, uh, that the growth is sublinear. Okay, uh, the next case, um, this is by Chase, Chase and Durrett. I'm going to span. Okay, and this was in uh, also in the 80s. I think it was like um, 84, 85 or something. So this is the case where TE is Bernoulli. Okay, so we have probability T is zero is a half, would be in the critical case, but the only other value allowed is one. Okay, uh, so in this case, uh, they proved, they found the correct uh, order of the growth. So I'll state it in terms of expected value, although uh, you, know, you can get similar results for just you know, almost sure. So the expected value is of order log n. So when I write this um, asymp here, it means that the uh, ratio of the left and right sides is bounded away from zero and infinity. So um, I think I'll explain uh, at least one of the bounds here, just to give you an idea of um, how this is related to percolation. 
anybody who, who knows percolation already will um, be able to prove this pretty easily at this point. But, um, but um, you know, it shows some of the ideas, I think. So um, I'll show you the idea of the lower bound. The upper bound is a little is similar, but it, uh, a little bit more complicated. Okay, so I'll, I'll draw it down here. All right, so we have our box P n and zeros in the middle. And I'm going to look at annuli, which are inside of this box. So they'll have aspect ratio two. So uh, here's the inner boundary, two to the k, and the outer boundary, two to the k plus one. <clears throat> okay, let's call this uh, annulus here, ak. I'm going to ask whether there exists a blocking circuit of ones in this annulus. So it's a, it's a circuit in the annulus going around zero. It needs to actually be in the dual lattice. So uh, this is a dual circuit and that is blocking a uh, circuit of ones. Okay, if there's any such circuit, then in order for me to get from zero to the boundary of the box size n, I have to cross it. So I have to take one of its edges. And um, well, they all have passage time one. So that means I need to accumulate at least uh, one passage time in this annulus. Okay, so um, I'm going to lower bound expected value of the passage time by expected value sum over all of these annuli. So that there will be order, if this is a box of size n, there will be order uh, log base two of n. So k equals one up to lower of log n of indicator there exists blocking circuit. in AK. Okay, well, there's a uh, famous theorem in um, 2D critical percolation called the russo seymour wells theorem. And it states that um, uh, the probability of having macroscopic connections like this, macroscopic paths, um, is bounded away from zero and one. But the usual statement is that if you take a rectangle, which is uh, n by 2n, and the probability that there is a path of all ones crossing in the uh, long direction is bounded away from zero and one. Now you can use that with uh, the FKG inequality to get that the uh, probability of having such a circuit is bounded away from zero. So I would say this is mostly by Russo Sumo Wells theorem. The probability here is bounded away from zero. We have log n many terms, so we get C log n for the lower bound. Now, now for the upper bound, um, you have to uh, control more circuits than this. You can actually write the passage time from zero to the boundary of the box size n uh, as equal to the maximal number of disjoint uh, blocking circuits around zero. And then uh, control how many of those intersect different annuli. The expected number of those that intersects any one of these annuli is bounded above by a constant. Okay, so um, this is the Bernoulli case. And actually, um, even more than this, um, there was a result by Keston and Zhang I think the paper was in 96 and um, they um, they looked at the uh, distributional properties so they proved a central limit theorem so they looked at this this same passage time uh, minus its mean and divide by um, the standard deviation, which they showed was order square root of log n, and prove that this converges to a standard normal. So this is in the Bernoulli case, I'll say again. So I, I think in reality, they put some constants down here, like Cn, uh, which were undetermined, but they were bounded away from zero infinity. So I'm going to, um, with them, even though you know it makes what I stated uh, strictly false. But um, so I think this is an interesting result because it's one of these cases in first pass percolation where you don't get the uh, Tracy Woodham limit. 
you get uh, some other distributional limit. You get a Gaussian in this case. There's another case, which is uh, if you look at first passage percolation in a thin cylinder, which has height, say it has width of order n, and then height order n to the alpha, where alpha is less than the wandering exponent, then in that case, you should uh, get Gaussian uh, fluctuations. And there was a paper by uh, Chatterjee and Day uh, quite a while ago that proved something like this um, under some assumption of exponents. And I think without assuming exponents, they could get for alpha less than one third, you get a Gaussian limit for this uh, cylinder time. Okay, so um, that's quite a bit of information about the Bernoulli case. Now uh, you can ask, um, we know that the path time grows like log, how about the constant in front? Can you actually get the constant? Well, um, it turns out that uh, there's a paper by Yao in 2018. So for this paper, he found the, the exact constant but um, you have to change the model a little bit. You have to go on the triangular lattice. So, um, because uh, they need to use uh, a bunch of um, results from uh, critical percolation on triangular lattice. So here we put, uh, we put the, um, the weights on the vertices instead of the edges, but then other than that, the model is the same. So he showed that the limit then goes to infinity of the passage sign divided by log n is equal to the following uh, strange number, one over two square root of three pi, almost surely. So the argument for this is, uh, has two parts. The first part is to say that, well, um, as I mentioned before, this passage time can be written uh, exactly as the maximum number of disjoint blocking circuits around the origin. He has some uh, color switching argument that shows that this variable has the same distribution as the number of cluster boundaries um, around um, of, um, that, that go around the origin. And this actually has a scaling limit, which is related to the CLE, the, um, the formal loop ensemble. And it turns out that uh, Sheffield and Werner, I think, computed the uh, moment generating function for the conformal radius, I think log of conformal radius of, the, um, of um, these cluster boundaries around the origin. So you can explicitly get the constant out of that, uh, that result. Okay, so um, then there was a work by me, uh, Jack Hansen and YK Lamb. This was a year ago. So here we considered uh, general distributions. Um, I am still on the triangular lattice. So uh, for a general distribution, we're going to define, so let, let's write a general critical TE. Okay, might have a problem there in a minute. Uh, general critical TE, meaning that, uh, well, I guess it, I should call it TV because they're on the vertices. Uh, so the, the probability to be zero will still be a half. And I'm gonna define here, um, sorry. My notation is I. For the infimum overall x such that fx is bigger than a half. So if my distribution for my weights, it has a delta mass at zero of size one half, and then it has some other stuff to the right. So whatever the other stuff is to the right, the infimum of that is called i. So if you have uh, Bernoulli weights, i is just one, but otherwise, you know, it could be anything basically. So the result here is that uh, this limit n goes to infinity, t0 boundary bn divided by log n. Well, we get um, this same uh, number up here, except the one is replaced by i. So it's equal to i divided by two root three pi, almost surely. So we call this a version of universality because um, it doesn't matter what critical distribution you take, as long as it has the same value of i, then you get the same, uh, the same limit here. This limit here, I would call the time constant for the model, although um, strictly speaking, the time constant is actually zero, um, but that doesn't really give you any information. So, um, so I would call this the time constant. So this is uh, the only case where you can explicitly solve for this, this first order behavior or the, uh, or the time constant. 
do you have any assumptions on the TV distribution? Uh, no, so for this result, you just, um, for this time constant, you don't need any moments or anything like that. If you want to know things about the growth of the expectation or the variance or something, then you need some, uh, some, um, some moment assumptions. What about continuity, some density or atomic? Does it matter? No, no, it just needs to have uh, delta mass at zero of one half, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so I, as, as you probably know, finding the time constant in the, uh, in the usual first acid percolation case is basically hopeless. I mean, it, I wouldn't even really consider it a problem because <laughs> it's, I, would, I think it's just impossible. But okay, so, um, so uh, we know when i is equal to zero that this passage time pn is small o of log n in the sense that if I divide by log n, it goes to zero. But uh, we could ask, uh, well, what is the actual growth rate in that case? Right? That's where um, over here, um, you just have mass going all the way down to zero. So the question then still is, uh, sorry, what is the true growth rate? Okay, so there's an interesting result from, uh, from the 90s by Zhang. It's in one of these books that's uh, pretty difficult to get online. That's the only place you can find the paper is somehow, you know, get a hold of this book. But uh, it's called Double Behavior. I think it was in like a festschrift or something. Double Behavior. Okay, so uh, to define this, uh, or to state this result, we're going to look at uh, what he calls the passage time to infinity. So we're going to uh, define this. So rho, I'll use this variable quite a bit. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of the passage time without normalizing at all. So just the limit of the passage time to the boundary of box of size n. We'll think of this as passage time to infinity for obvious reasons. Okay, and there's actually a, a different representation of this, which I like a little bit more. It's the infimum of T gamma for all gamma, which are infinite, self-avoiding, and contain zero. Okay, so uh, we know based on what I said up there, uh, if I is positive, so in particular, if you have Bernoulli, then uh, rho is equal to infinity. Actually, it's true almost surely. This, uh, this rho is um, either equal to infinity or finite with probability one uh, by zero one law. Okay, so uh, the result of, of Zhang is actually that um, you can find critical distributions for which rho is finite. This is a theorem. There exists, so this is by Zhang, I guess. So I think it's clear from the, um, from the discussion. So uh, there exists critical TEs such that rho is finite almost surely. So I think this is interesting because indeed it shows double behavior. In this uh, critical case, if you take Bernoulli, then for you know, something with i is positive, then the passage time um, to infinity is infinite. But uh, his result says that there, there exists critical ones with rho is finite. So I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it is here. So for, if I take a parameter a positive, I can define the following distribution function. So let's set fa of x. It's going to equal 1 if x is bigger than the number 1 half to the one over a, it will be one half plus x to the a if zero less than or equal to x less than or equal to one half to the one over a, and otherwise zero if x is less than zero. Okay, so I'll draw you a picture here, just like this. We have zero up until zero, and then we jump to a half. And here's one. 
and we increase there up until some number, one half to the one over a. Then after that point, I just stay equal to one. Okay, so you can see from the, uh, so this is fa. You can see from the drawing that if a is very small, what you're gonna see near zero is like, uh, you know, um, um, very steep uh, climb, right? So that would mean that there are a lot of very low weights. And um, his result is that if a is small enough, then um, rho is finite almost surely. So somehow what happens is that as you move out from the origin, you can take a lot of large zero clusters because they're critical. But once I want to leave a zero cluster, I have to take a positive edge. And there are enough positive edges with very low weight that I can take the smallest one on the boundary of a cluster and then get into another zero cluster and then take an even smaller uh, positive weight after that. And these will all sum up to be finite. So in the same paper, he conjectured that if A is large, then uh, rho is infinite almost surely. So he didn't give a precise uh, you know, transition value of A or anything, but um, this was a conjecture. Okay, so um, the next work was uh, by me and Waikid Lam and Xuan Wang. Waikid was my um, student and Wang was my postdoc in 2015. So in this result, we found uh, the, um, an exact condition on F that tells you whether uh, rho is finite or infinite. And it gives you also the, uh, the correct growth rate for all critical distributions. So to, uh, to state it, I need to define the inverse distribution function so here's F inverse of T, it's in FEMA, overall X such that FX at least T. Um, normally give this in basic probability. So this would be just the inverse if F uh, were verbal, but it may not be. Okay, so the exact condition is this. One has rho finite almost surely, if and only if, the sum over k f inverse one half plus one over two to the k is finite. So if you give me the distribution function, I just take the inverse and sum up this sum, and then I can tell whether rho is finite. And obviously, uh, you know, from the zero one law I talked about before, uh, otherwise um, rho is infinite almost surely. So notice that um, if you take Bernoulli distribution, then, well, it's just gonna be zero, uh, have a jump at one half, and then um, have another jump at one. This inverse is always gonna be one. So you're summing a bunch of ones and you'll get infinity, which corresponds to what we, uh, what we know. So from this result, you can plug in Zhang's FA. So for FA, what you actually get for F inverse is something like one over two to the K over A which is summable for all A's. So you get uh, rho is finite for all A, uh, sorry, for all A positive. Actually, the you can see where the transition happens. It happens more like on exponential scale rather than polynomial. And uh, there's another family of distributions he gave in that uh, paper uh, where you can see the transition. He calls it G sub B. So in other words, the conjecture was false. So that's, uh, that's telling you when is rho uh, finite or infinite. Next, if we have some uh, mild moment condition, I think probably anybody would agree this is mild, uh, te to the one fourth plus epsilon, if that's finite, for some epsilon. Then the expected passage time is uh, found at above and below by constants of um, this partial sum, sum k equals one to log n of f inverse one half plus one over two to the k. So again, in the Bernoulli case, we know these f inverses are one. So the right-hand side is just log, which is the chase chase to red result. 
but uh, you can see that you can get uh, basically arbitrarily slow growth as long as you put a lot of mass near zero. And uh, there are also results in that paper uh, for the variance. I won't state explicitly, but I um, can actually see the time. Uh, variance. Uh, it, yeah, maybe I'll just state what the variance, uh, the order of the variance. You need a moment condition for this, but it's uh, TE to the one half plus epsilon. So the variance of the passage time is of order sum k equals one to log n of f inverse one half plus one over two to the k, all squared. And the last result, which I won't state precisely, is just that we also have a uh, central limit theorem. So uh, in the case where the uh, variance and the um, expected value both diverge to infinity, then we have a Gaussian central limit theorem. And um, that, I think that answers a uh, question of the um, Kessin and Zhang paper from 96, because in their paper, they considered Bernoulli distribution and got a Gaussian limit. But actually their proof works as long as this I variable that I defined is positive. In other words, as long as there's a gap between zero and the rest of the distribution, then you can run their proof and you'll still get a Gaussian limit. But as long as I is zero, then the proof doesn't work. So they um, asked in their paper, you know, what happens in that case. So um, if the, uh, uh, it, it's possible here for the mean to diverge and the variance to diverge, in that case, you have a central limit theorem. If the mean diverges, but the variance uh, remains bounded, then in that case, when you subtract the expected value, you get convergence and distribution to something. And then if the mean and the variance are both bounded, then uh, the, uh, the variables uh, just, just converge. So. Okay, so that's, um, that's all of the um, results up until this point. Um, the rest of the talk, I wanna talk about a version of this model we started to think about uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, which is like a dynamical percolation model. And I'll explain some of the, uh, some of the results we have so far. So here's a dynamical version. So for this discussion, we'll stay on the uh, triangular lattice. Although um, the results that I talked about here, this result that we did in 2015 is valid for general lattices and Zhang's work is also valid for general lattices. So basically after this point, we transition back to general lattices, and now I'm gonna go back to the triangular lattice. Okay, so I'm gonna have, um, you know, as usual, vertex weights. I'll call them TV, or V in the triangular lattice, I'll call that bold T. And we will assume critical again. So F zero is a half. Okay, so just like in dynamical percolation, we're going to assign to every vertex a rate one Poisson process. And when it increments, then we're gonna resample the weight. So we resample uh, each weight independently at rate one. So that gives us a family of configurations, which I will denote by um, TV, T, or all T positive. So uh, I guess this notation is sort of terrible that I have T appearing in two places, but um, the TVs will be the vertex weights and then this uh, T inside of here is like time. Okay, and last we're gonna set um, rho sub T to be that variable rho, the passage time to infinity in the configuration TV sub T. So uh, rho at time T, basically. And uh, because we'll use this F inverse uh, one half plus one over two to the K um, tons of times, we're, we're gonna give some notation for it. So AK is gonna be F inverse one half plus one over two to the K. So in this notation, uh, rho is finite almost surely, if and only if the sum of the AKs is finite. Okay, so um, this, uh, this process is set up so that at every time we have the same distribution for the configurations. So um, 
uh, let's say that I assume that I have a distribution where the AKs are summable, then for any given time, uh, the passage time to infinity is finite. So this rho t is finite for any fixed t. But um, as you do in this type of model, you would like to ask uh, whether uh, you can have some exceptional times. So that is uh, random times t for which rho t has the opposite behavior. So rho t may be infinite for those random times. So that's the main question. I think this has been studied for many types of models, uh, certainly in uh, dynamical percolation, also in this um, dynamical discrete web and Brownian web uh, models. Are there exceptional times? Okay, so I'll state the result that we have at this point. Uh, as I said, this is in progress, so we don't know everything. Uh, there are a lot of uh, questions that are, um, we'd like to answer. So here's the theorem. This is with me, my student, David Harper, Jack Hansen, and again, Y.K. Lamb. I'm not sure that I mentioned before um, in this. Um, oh, I did mention it in there, so okay. Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna have two possible cases. Um, one where the AKs are summable and one where the AKs are not summable. So in the first case, we're going to assume that the sum of AK is infinity. So maybe we're in the Bernoulli case or something like that. So here, uh, as a reminder, rho is infinite almost surely at any given time. Okay, so we find a transition um, in the dimensions of exceptional times depending on the, um, the, the rate of decay of the AKs. So there are two results here. The first one is that if the lin soup k goes to infinity, of k a k is infinity. So that is, at least on a subsequence, a k has um, uh, does not decay to zero uh, at order one over k or any slope or any faster. Then we find almost surely the dimension, the Hausdorff dimension the set of times such that rho t is less than or equal to x. So if you take uh, for x positive, this, uh, this dimension equals 31 over 36. So, that, this, so the hazard dimension of exceptional times in this case is 31 over 36. If you know anything about dynamical percolation, then um, if you set in this case x equals zero, so x equals zero would mean that uh, rho t is zero. The only way rho t is gonna be zero is if there's an infinite path of all zeros starting at zero. And then this, this question is, is really uh, the same as the dynamical percolation question. And this was studied by a bunch of authors uh, the, uh, the paper that actually found this dimension in the end was by Garban, Pete, and Schramm. There was an earlier paper by Schramm and Steiff where the, they got the upper bound, I think. But um, so this, uh, the x equals zero case um, was already done by Garban, Pete, and Schramm in, uh, I think, 2010. So the result says that uh, the same dimension as you see for exceptional times in dynamical percolation holds as long as AK um, has this growth rate. Okay, so um, that's the Hausdorff dimension. Now, um, we would like to have all the results be about Hausdorff dimension, but we can't actually at this moment prove anything more about Hausdorff dimension. So we're going to resort to Minkowski dimension. So uh, let me just restate or, or state that this result also holds for the, uh, for the upper Minkowski dimension. So similar or Minkowski dimension. Now the Minkowski dimension is actually defined for bounded sets. So the way that we have to formulate is a little bit differently. So if we take probability that the upper Minkowski dimension of the set of times in an interval, just to make it bounded, less than or equal to x. Probability that this dimension is equal to 31 over 36 converges to one as t goes to infinity. Now it's possible that if you just take a bounded interval, then uh, in that interval of time, all the edge weights or all the vertex weights near zero are super large. They're bigger than a million. 
and they just stay that way, you know, in the whole interval. So this set could be empty. But, you know, as you take capital T to be larger and larger, this set will eventually be non-empty. Okay, so that's the first result. What happens when uh, this limb soup is not infinity? Well, if we assume that k a k goes to zero, then actually this Minkowski dimension transitions and it becomes one. So the probability that the upper Minkowski dimension of the set of t and zero t, such that rho t less than or equal to x, probability that this equals one converges to one as t goes to infinity. Now for this, you can't take um, x equals zero because x equals zero is the GPS case, which we already know is 31 over 36. So this is um, for x positive. Okay, so th these are uh, the results um, in the case where ak is uh, not summable. So the other side is um, where we assume that the sum of AK is finite. So in that case, of course, that's the uh, row finite case. So here, the passage time to infinity is normally finite. So we need to look at times where it's uh, um, abnormally large, so it's infinity. Now this is a little bit like times of non-percolation, if you read anything about um, dynamical percolation. And there it's, uh, can happen that you have no exceptional times at all. And that's what we find in a certain uh, regime here. So um, if we assume that the sum of k to the 7 eighths ak is finite, then almost surely the set of exceptional times, so that's the t at least zero, such that rho t is infinity, almost surely this is empty. Now the seven eighths uh, is definitely not the right uh, <laughs> the right answer. I mean, it's not, it's not it shouldn't be the right condition. It's just that this is what our proof gives, and we've been trying for a while to decrease this exponent, but haven't been able to. I I, I don't know if um, if you take an a k such that the sum is finite, but maybe a k is of order one over n log squared n or something like that. Maybe in that case you can produce exceptional times. We haven't been able to do so, so far. But um, I guess my feeling is that um, if there is a boundary between their existing exceptional times and not, it should be somewhere uh, along that order, like one over n log to a power n or something like that. Okay, so just to uh, kind of summarize the results here in a little picture. So here on the right-hand side, we have that the sum of ak is infinite. On the left side, sum of ak is finite. Now, when sum of ak is infinite, we have a transition here. Where we have dimension 31 over 36 on the right, dimension 1 on the left. Over here, k ak is going to infinity. And over here, k ak goes to 0. Now, on the left hand side, the condition k 7 eighths ak, if this is uh, finite, then we get empty. And in this region here, we don't know what's going on. Okay, any questions at this point? That's, that's basically the end of my um, um, uh, presentation of the material. I will, uh, I can talk a little bit about the proof of, um, of one of these things. Um. Yeah. So in, in the first result, part B, yeah. is the understanding that uh, if X is somehow scaled to zero together with capital T, you should be able to interpolate between the dimensions one and 31 over 36. Um, yeah, so um, actually what happens, at least for the Minkowski dimension, is that if K A K remains bounded away from zero and infinity, then um, we can actually show that the Minkowski dimension depends on X. Um, now, for that Hausdorff dimension, I, 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 I don't know. It could, um, in reality, this part A here for the Hausdorff dimension, we can even prove this as long as the limb soup is positive. So, um, for the Hausdorff dimension, the Minkowski dimension is different, but for Hausdorff dimension, as long as the limb soup is positive, you get 31 over 36. 
And so uh, the complement or the negation of that would be that k a k goes to zero, which is case case b. In that case, it could be that the Hausdorff dimension just jumps to one, but, but we don't know at this point. But at least to make sure that I got it correctly. So if in part b, if x is actually identically equal to zero and not positive, yeah, then the GPS result tells you that the dimension, the Minkowski dimension, is uh, thirty-one over thirty-six with probability one. Yeah, that's right. Oh, oh, Minkowski dimension. Um, yeah, Minkowski okay. dimension is weirder because you have to look at a bounded set. So oh, okay. it could be empty. So, but if you took this sort of limit, you would get 31 over 36. Okay, well, thank you. Sure. Okay, so um, I'll explain that proof idea here for one of these results. So I'll explain this uh, part B down here when you have no exceptional times. So uh, we'll um, prove if k is a seven eighths, a k is summable, then that means that uh, no exceptional times. Okay, so uh, we're gonna use a fact here, which is uh, pretty easy to prove and uh, quite believable, I think. <laughs> um, so if you have an event a n and it depends on uh, vertex weights, uh, what is going on? Vertex weights in a box of size two to the n. And suppose that this event has incredibly low probability. So, and probability a n is bounded by, say, e to the minus 100 n. Well, because it's uh, so unlikely, that it actually never happens, not at any time. So uh, from this, you have the sum over n of the probability that a n occurs in uh, the configuration at time t, where some t zero, one is actually summable. Basically, you just have to like um, take a very fine lattice of points uh, between zero and one and use a union bound and make sure that you don't have any flips between those points. Um, and so from this, Royal Cantelli would tell you that for all t, if n is large, a n does not occur. Um, I guess almost surely. Okay, so uh, we want to show that there are no exceptional times. So we want to use this, uh, this fact and uh, we want to um, come up with some events which have incredibly low probability. Okay, so for that, we're going to use a uh, tail down which appeared in a paper of me and Pong Fei Tang in 2017. So this is, um, this uh, result was used to uh, estimate um, the length of geodesics in this critical case. You know that in the, um, in what I was calling the subcritical case, which is the case that most people study in first pass percolation, the length of a geodesic between zero and say NE1 is with high probability, no larger than linear. So no bigger than a large constant times N. But in the critical case, geodesics are much longer. You have a super linear length. So um, in order to prove that, we, we prove some kind of tail down on passage times. So uh, to describe that, let me define for you what I'll call T max. So this will be the maximum over uh, some vertices X and Y. So I'll, I'll explain what X and Y, uh, where X and Y are allowed to live uh, by a picture. So here we take an annulus to the N plus one and two to the n. And x has to be on the inner boundary and y has to be on the outer boundary. So we look at all possible pairs, x and y, um, in this type of configuration and take the maximal passage time. Okay, then um, the result is there exists an m such that probability t max n bigger than m n cubed a n is bounded by e to the minus 100 n. 
So the, I mean, in the paper, we didn't write e to the minus 100 n. This uh, here's just a tail down. And if you plug in a large enough m, then you'll get e to the minus 100 n. And this is not exactly right when I'm writing. The, uh, the a n here is something more like a n over log n or something. But um, it's not really that important right now. OK, so this is an event which, occur, which has such low probability that it just never happens. So from the fact above, we get that for all t, this rho t, can, uh, the passive time to infinity, can be bounded above by the sum of the t max variables. So t max at time t over n less n. And we know these t maxes are no bigger than order n cube uh, a n. So uh, this will be less than or equal to some t dependent random constant uh, ct times m times the sum of n cubed a n. Now, if, uh, what we actually want to show here is that if the sum of n to the 7 eighths a n uh, converges, then, uh, then we have no exceptional times. Uh, but this argument here shows that if we assume that uh, something's stronger, if the sum of n cubed a n is finite, then you can basically plug in the tail bound from before into this fact and you'll get that rho t is finite for all times. In other words, no exceptional times. Uh, so this would mean no exceptional times. Now, as I said, what I claimed was stronger than this. So you have to improve this argument in a couple of ways. So uh, I'll just list uh, how this needs to be improved. And I think that'll be about the end. Okay, so first of all, uh, these T max variables are weakly dependent on each other. So uh, T max ends are weakly dependent. Actually, you can quantify you know, their, um, their strong mixing coefficient. So they're weakly dependent. And uh, they're, so, they're so, um, uh, so, weakly so weakly dependent that you can apply um, basically uh, results for IID or for independent random variables. So um, if you use this weak dependence along with a, uh, the, the actual form of this tail bound, which is in the paper, then um, so we can apply um, large deviation bounds, not for T max, but for the sum of T max. A equals one up to N, T max K yeah. times T. See up here, we just needed that the sum, we cared about the sum of T maxes. So we just need to bound the sum and we can reduce the uh, N cubed up here. We can reduce the N cubed to uh, N squared by, by applying these. Okay, that doesn't quite get us to N to the seven eighths. So how do you get N to the seven eighths? Well, uh, you have to get a better inequality up here. So um, to go from and q or n squared to n to the seven eighths need a better tail down. So the, the original um, argument up here for this inequality, um, basically it has to do with what are called four arm points in uh, near critical percolation. And there's a way of estimating uh, the moments of the number of uh, four arm points in a box. Uh, Basically, there's a simple way to do it, a sort of simple, which was done by Keston back in the 80s. If you apply this type of argument, you get the n cubed up here. But there's a uh, more recent paper by Demeter Kiss from like 2013 or 2012 or something, where he tries to estimate the upper tail large deviation behavior for, um, for uh, the, um, the number of uh, vertices in the, maximal, in, the, in the largest critical cluster in a box. And to do this, you need to give upper bounds on all the moments of the number of uh, vertices uh, inside the largest critical cluster in a box. So when you take like the seventh moment or something, then you're basically summing over all seven tuples of points of the probability that they're all in the largest cluster in the box. And depending on where these points are in relation to each other, you can actually improve the Keston argument. It, it gets quite complicated, but um, he was able to show that the correct uh, exponent for the, um, you know, if you look at the probability that the largest cluster in a box is bigger than n squared times n, sorry, n to the 91 over 48, which is the correct order, times lambda, 
is bounded above by e to the minus lambda to something like 91 over 40, 91 over 5, some ridiculously large number, like near 20 or something. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, if you use this, this argument to try to improve the t max uh, inequality, you can reduce this n cubed uh, down to um, n to the 15 eighths, I think. Um, and so if you combine that with this first part, which allows you to reduce the exponent by one, you get down to seven eighths. So this uses, attempts to use the argument of uh, Demeter Kiss, which is pretty interesting in, uh, by itself, you know, look at it. Okay, so that's, um, that's all I have to say, thank you. Michael? And are there any questions? Uh, I have a, a question. Uh, I think you uh, mentioned, the only time you mentioned anything about higher dimensions was, was uh, in the beginning, I think you mentioned something, maybe a result of Keston's. Uh, I was wondering what, I don't even remember what, 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 that, what that result was, but is there, is there any, anything at all uh, that one either knows or suspects happens differently uh, for the critical uh, case in very high dimensions? Yeah, so uh, up until recently, I think there wasn't really any work on this, but uh, there is work that is coming out sometime soon by um, uh, Luigi Adario Berry and Jack Hansen. If you're in the, um, if you're above the critical dimension, so I, th I think you need, you know, whatever the base expansion to work or whatever then um, they can find the correct growth rate in the Bernoulli case. It's not log n anymore, it's ordered log log n. Okay. And I think they can even find the constant in front, depending on the dimension. Like if you're in dimension six or something, then it's like one, and then if you're in eight and higher, it's two or something. So um, it's pretty precise. Um, I don't know where they are in terms of uh, general distributions, but the Bernoulli case, you see a difference. <clears throat> Thank you. Interesting. Other questions? No other questions? Okay, I guess we'll, we'll thank Michael again for his great talk. Thanks very much. <laughs>